Here we are in the Southern Ocean, West Antarctic Peninsula, on the Elysium Expedition. This region of the ocean is particularly sensitive to climate change. The salps tend to be moving in from those more northerly areas, displacing the krill, and the krill populations are on the decline. This is a route that Shackleton took, so we're going to follow in his footsteps, but we're going to be sampling the plankton along the way. We've got a video plankton recorder and a holographic camera to uh, get images of plankton. And then we can take this, essentially a TIFF image, and reconstruct this entire volume at a few microns distance from each other. So we get slices through this volume uh, separated by about 200 microns. The resolution on these images is about 9 microns. So we can see very small organisms, copepods, and other dominant plankton. We have a camera over here. We take 30 pictures per second as this is being towed through the water. So the water is flowing through here and we're getting a picture of a volume about the size of my little finger. So what we want to look at is whether um, the salps and the krill um, are feeding on the same sort of food here and what sort of food they're feeding on. So one of the theories of global warming here is that the increased fresh water from the melt of the glaciers is causing the plants to be much smaller. So you're getting a community of much smaller plants. So what that means is that favors the salps. And so the krill may not be able to feed as efficiently. If they can't feed as efficiently, the population will decline. And if the population declines, then the whales and the seals and the penguins will also decline. Southern Ocean at night for plankton with a video plankton recorder, a holographic camera, and a plankton net. 220 meters because it's hanging out at an angle, so that'll give us plenty of depth, record the position and the time that's all taken. We have a holographic camera that's snapping pictures with a laser every three seconds. The jackpot was sucked. holographic camera on there. And this is a hologram uh, 
Actually, this window here shows the hologram itself, which is an interference pattern between a reference beam and an object beam. They've tricked the computer into thinking it's doing that, when in actual fact, it's reconstructing slices through this volume, basically taking the hologram and, and doing some mathematics to reconstruct pictures. One of the biggest effects of global warming is sea level rise. My view is that with climate change, what we're going to see is a gradual deterioration of the life systems in, in the Earth. We should educate the kids, and they are the ones who should be educating their grandparents. The challenges of Antarctica protecting this pristine environment that is not only critical for Antarctica, but critical for the health of the entire planet. That, I think that would be a really good way to get the word out about um, Antarctica and the environmental uh, I guess adversities that it's facing and I think that's probably the way it's going to have to be if we want young people to listen and actually care about what the planet's going through. It's, yeah, in today's sort of high media society where
this is uh, really quite a pleasant hike in the hills in South Georgia, but of course it means more than that because this is uh, where Shackleton and Crean and Worsley came over the hill in a faster time, I think, than almost anybody has done it since, and it's eminently historical. So, who that guy just up there, Jonathan, on board with us? This is uh, the early hours of the morning. On the far side of Fortuna Bay, they've heard the, uh, the whistle, the steam whistle, for the workers to come come into the whaling factory in Stromness, and they knew they were getting close. For about a thousand feet, they came down to the slow bees, we came on rocky road gradients, then across low hills, all rocks, the last got cleared this and onto the shore. From here, we could look up and see a faint, thin line, like a spider, zigzagging in places. Our tracks on the incredible face we descended, which was up, up across the bay. We passed several inquisitive gentoo penguins, John, 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 yeah. like little Charlie Chaplins, and many great sea elephants, until we came to the front of the great glacier, fortunately did not reach quite to the sea. There were long gravelly flats, debris of the glacier, almost like quicksands in which we sank halfway to our knees, which we did too, isn't it? The going was for good for about half a mile along the beach at the head of Fortuna Bay. Here we saw reindeer tracks and a dead sea elephant, shot by some sportsman. Then past some low cliff, and over rough country we made our way inland. As we ascended, the going became better. And now we look for the best way to Stromness Bay. Big Fork Sound with three whaling stations. Busvik, Stromness and Leith, all run by Norwegians. Leith and Stromness were nearer, but the question was, which was easy to get to? Soranus decided for Stromness, so we bore a little further to the right. Soon we were going along in great style. Then suddenly, Crean fell through, up to his middle in ice water. We were crossing a lake without knowing it. And this is the very lake here. We pulled him out and hurriedly but gingerly made our way to the nearest raised surface. After this, about 11, are we getting off the time? A bit late. After this, about 11, we had a biscuit, some streamers, nut food, three or four lumps of sugar, and some snow. Cream was a bit cold, but otherwise, none would the worse for his ducking. This is, uh, Shackleton, Crean and Worsley, now we're reaching the final stages of their 36 hour trek across South Georgia, which had never been done before. They had no maps other than an outline map produced by Filchner's German expedition. Uh, but they did know, having heard the sound of the factory whistle, that uh, they were heading in the right direction. On again up rough country, which is what we're going to do now, till finally at 1.15 we were standing on a 3,000 foot summit. Well, exaggerating a bit I think. <laughs> Looking down onto Stromness Bay, the two whalers, which could be zodiacs in our time, steaming across it looking like tiny insects on the water. We could also see that part of the whaling station. I yelled a wave to get against the skyline, but of course no one saw or heard. Uh, the point where Shackleton, Crean and Worsley saw the whaling station and for the second time shook hands. He shook each other's hands because they knew they'd nearly finished this amazing journey. All they had to do then was to go down the quite steep slopes here along the plain and into the, the whaling station. And they could see the little whale catchers like little insects in the bay there. And they knew this is the first time they'd seen any other people for over a year and a half very hard to imagine. So we're going to follow their trail down carefully. It is quite a snowy, slippy day for us today, but what a wonderfully exciting thing to be retracing those steps. Beautiful. It was a very steep slope down towards the station, and I wanted to take it, but Sir Ernest thought it was too steep. So we bore to the left down a valley. Six years later to the month, I came down that slope with a crouching glissade about, for five, about 500 feet. I don't know whether we'll do that today.
But anyway, this was these three guys were exactly on track, following them, and we're gonna I don't know if we're gonna slide down the far side, but we're gonna maybe go alongside the waterfall, which was frozen in May 1916, which they used a rope and a carpenter's ads to, to get down their final stage, uh, down onto the um, the floodplain of the, the um, leading to Stromness wedding station. And they also knew that once they got to Stromness, the lives of the men, the lives of the men at Elephantine were standing a much better chance of being rescued, which actually didn't happen until about four months later. But uh, I would love to have seen their arrival in the wedding station here. We'll see the old remains of it, but you know the whaling guys must have been completely incredulous as to what was before their eyes. These three bearded, dirty men who'd done the huge, big journey across the roughest seas in the world. There they were at their doorsteps, so completely speechless they must have been. Nearly there. We came down here with the intention of studying the plankton of the West Antarctic Peninsula to see the effect of global warming. So what I try to do is to find out um, what's happening to the populations of the krill, what's happening to the populations of the animals that depend on krill. And hopefully with this under better understanding we can uh, get a grip on how the Earth's warming is affecting not only the Southern Ocean but other areas of the world as well. And my interest is in trying to be able to to locate, I mean at this point, it's uh, locate animals that we have no idea about. It took us to the peninsula, and it took us to Elephant Island, and it took us to South Georgia, places we could have gone to individually, but as a group, it's it just become this synergistic energy that is just multiplied. The human element that was involved in this trip, the kind of people that everybody brought in so much knowledge and experience of life was amazing. Michael has reached across borders and countries and all over the world and the fact that we have we have everybody from you know what, 14 different countries on this boat right now and we're going to the one place on earth that's owned by no one. Different philosophy, one of different uh uh, photographers, painters, sculptors, and filmmakers. We, we wanted a lot of different perspective on various issues. We want to work with them, and this becomes a really, a really good momentum. And then to wrap that around the Shackleton journey, epic journey, it's incredible. It's a way to share knowledge, information, friendship. It really is. It's a new vision. It's like a vision to see and the knowledge to know and to really go out and convince this planet, all peoples of the planet, how important the work that we have to do. Being here with you guys is just uh, overwhelming. And I think it's going to show this incredible journey that we all just shared with Michael. You get here and you think, oh my God, oh my God, is that po oh my God, is that possible? And then you roll into the water and it's a whole other universe. It's a whole other universe that's unlike anywhere else. For 
us underwater photographers is something brand new and extraordinarily exciting. This place is a symphony of biology and life and noise and it's almost information overload. We've had some extremely special landings and to actually feel the place where Shackleton and his men were has been fairly unique. Everybody is basically governed by the oceans. Even our internal physiology is a saline situation that is inherited from the sea. We are of the sea. We know there are delicate areas that are beginning to degrade. We only have so much time. And now is the time because you don't know how much longer you have. No. What I do in my life, how can I impact anything? And the life of Ernest Shackleton inspired me a lot especially on the journey, the epic journey, surviving with 27 men and bring one, every one of them back to life. It's not about success, sometimes it's about failure and living it out. So I have a story now, and I have a group of people. Now how to bring everybody together on one vessel and make a, and do a project, a book, a documentary. We live in a time that very few heroes. By using this book as a tribute to Shackleton, we hope to get the story out there, especially to kids, how we, we should live, how we should be a hero.